my name is John McNally and I'm the co-project lead on the Flying Kestrel project. So for those that don't know about the Flying Kestrel, um, sitting behind me is the car in question. It's a 1935 Riley Kestrel 9 that myself and my dad found in a barn in Holland. Um, it had been sitting around since 1965 and it certainly wasn't in the state it's currently in. Um, so our plan was to bring it back to the UK and bring a new lease of life to it but that kind of developed further and you know for us at Kestrel Beer doing bold things is what we're about so we came up with the idea of turning it into the fastest Riley in the world which then spiralled into attempting to break uh, several uh, land speed records with it. Um, so we had an initial version one of the Flying Kestrel which we took testing up at Elvington Raceway um, just after Covid had you know, kind of relaxed a bit and um, you know the day was progressing well but we noticed aerodynamic changes were needed and uh, on one of the test runs towards the end of the day as it often happens the last run um, the car unexpectedly fell on its side essentially flipped on its side <laughs> Uh, luckily the driver John um, was okay and that was our biggest concern at the time um, but once we knew he was okay and you know we'd had a chat with him we decided to go again so what you see here is version two um, the exact same car um, but version two of the flying Kestrel so for all of us the biggest thing was to actually retain as much of the original car as possible whilst seeing how difficult or close we could get to breaking a land speed record um, and whilst the car is in its race spec so it hasn't got its lights on or anything like that um, we have managed to retain 80% of the original car which includes the original chassis the original ash frame um, and lots of other internal parts that um, you would see on an original 1935 Riley Kestrel 9. So following the crash we decided to invest in some wind tunnel time uh, after making some aerodynamic changes, um, we changed out the gearbox as well and we found these changes made a massive difference uh, in terms of the stability of the car at high speed. So the car is capable now of reaching up to 235 miles an hour based on power weight um, and aerodynamics. Um, so we went again in 2021 and it was an easy day but you know we got lots done and we walked away with seven land speed records. Uh, having only used half the power because of some cooling issues. So for us, it was a fantastic achievement to get the goal that we set out to do. Um, however, we knew the car could go a lot, lot faster. So the next step for us was sort out the cooling issues. Um, you know, this is a research and development car. No one's done it before. So for us, we, we knew there will be constant steps to get to where we want to be. Uh, so we wanted to sort out the cooling issues and see how close we could get to the 200 mile per hour mark and even past that 200 mile per hour barrier. Um, so we made some changes, added some nitrous oxide as well to help cool the car, but also give it some more power. Uh, and now we're <laughs> effectively, we've got a 992 brake horsepower uh, land speed record car. So this year we went up to Elvington again. Uh, and we unfortunately chose a time of the year where the weather wasn't fantastic. Um, and Elvington is kind of its own microclimate in a lot of ways. So whatever the weather's saying, it will be probably the opposite there. And unfortunately the weather 
made it very difficult for us to put uh, more than half the power down. Um, but what we did was we could see that the changes that we'd made to the car had a massive effect on the performance. Uh, I'm really positive about today. Um, we've, uh, we've done further development on the car, like stemming from the last test, uh, which all looks great again on the dyno. Um, so we're going to put it into practice and see what, how good the car returns on the track. A heap of stuff that can go wrong uh, with motorsport and motorsport's a bit unpredictable. There's so many mechanical parts to, that, can get, that can fail, there's the weather, the track conditions, that kind of stuff, so uh, you've just got to have an open mind, so we come here with an open mind. Probably too good the cooling, mm. if anything. So check the oil level. Uh, seems alright, the engine looks healthy enough, but it's dropping in the shifts, it's dropping loads of boost out of it. So we're going to put a little bit of gas in it to keep the boost up. We're not going to go any more on the boost at the moment, yeah. just see if it see works. It motorsport anything can go wrong um, and I think it's just a case of see how much further progress we can make. So during our last run, John noticed some potential engine damage as he was heading towards the pits. And at the same time, we believe he may have hit a bump in the road, which inadvertently triggered the fire extinguisher as he was exiting the car. With a car like this, which is a one-off, uh, so really it's an R&D project, uh, and every time you run it, you use the information you get to develop the car further. Sometimes it goes really good, sometimes you go backwards, sometimes you stay still. So, obviously, we are disappointed them not achieving the 200 miles an hour today. But that said, you've got to take the positives. We've learned that we are on, we're on the right track. You know. We've made an, uh, a number of initiatives to improve the performance of this car. Those initiatives are working. Um, unfortunately, the fire extinguisher went off. Things happen, but it wasn't about the quality of the engineering of the car. We know that, you know, given the right, you know, weather and, and the track, we, we can actually achieve this 200 miles an hour. And we're gonna come back next year to do precisely that.